Hi, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I had a um, problem with my internet, and uh, I'll get that addressed. But in the meantime, here's a podcast to take you through uh, these slides. Okay, we were talking about an update on COVID-19. I'll just briefly go over the three slides I got through so that you have them all in one podcast. Uh, so I mentioned that Johnson & Johnson has an emergency use authorization granted over this past weekend. It is shipping to Ohio right now and will be uh, in Ohio arms this week. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single dose versus a two-shot regime, although they're doing a clinical trial right now for the effects of two doses. Um but the one right now is a single dose. It uses an adenovirus um, that is uh, a common cold virus uh, that has been modified. The DNA of that virus has been modified um, so that it can't replicate, so it doesn't give you a cold. Uh, and also the DNA codes for the spike protein as DNA, and that DNA is delivered into the nucleus of the cell, then that DNA is transcribed to RNA, and that RNA makes spike protein. Uh, it doesn't mean that the DNA becomes part of your DNA. Uh, it's just delivered in the nucleus because that's where transcription happens. A uh, big advantage of this virus vaccine is that it's stable under standard refrigerator and freezer temperatures uh, up to two years uh, in a regular minus 20 freezer it can be made at very big scales um, their estimate is that there's going to be enough vaccine with the three that are approved for everyone in the united states including more people than there are in the united states um, by the end of july um, this platform, this way of, of making a vaccine uh, activates the parts of the immune system that make both antibodies, that's humoral immunity, and then also cell-based immunity. These are T-cells, helper cells, uh, cytotoxic T-cells, uh, natural killer cells, those sorts of cell-based immunities. Um, it's not that the other vaccines don't. Uh, it's just that that wasn't known at the time of beginning those other clinical trials, and this one it was known because it's been same idea has been used to develop other vaccines. Um, over forty thousand people in the trial from the United States, Latin America, and South Africa. Seventy-two percent of the people who got the vaccine showed no symptoms of COVID nineteen. Um, that's not as high as the 94% that has been shown for Pfizer and Moderna, uh, but it's still really, really good. And importantly, 85%, this 72% is for the United States. 85% um, avoid severe disease, severe disease being defined as less than 94% blood saturation and 100% um, protection against uh, death and hospitalization. So that's a really big deal. If uh, we can get um, everybody vaccinated and uh, they don't end up in the hospital uh, and they don't end up dying, obviously that's a big um, um, benefit uh, for avoiding um, the effects of this virus. Uh, it's less effect. It was less effective in South Africa. Fifty percent, fifty-seven percent of people who got the vaccine showed no um, symptoms. But the South African variant, so-called uh, variant, the variant first identified in South Africa, um, has shown properties in that it's able to avoid um, the antibodies that are typically made against the spike protein as a result of being vaccinated. Um, the Pfizer vaccine has done really well in the real world. Uh, so there's a study in Israel uh, 
that has over a million people in it, half of which got the vaccine, and the population that got the vaccine had symptomatic COVID-19 down 94%. That's really, really strong numbers. Um, hospitalization down 87%. So in the real world, it works, not just in clinical trials. There are There's evidence of convergent evolution happening among these different variants. So um, fairly different sequences depending on where you're starting. Um, and those sequences seem to be converging on these same mutations. So these same mutations, E484K and 501Y, uh, have shown up from different origins over and over and over again, uh, by indicated by these dots. Uh, so these are selected for uh, in the population because um, they can avoid uh, antibodies that are produced um, as a result of infection, and they are more transmissible. So there are um, approaches to go after these variants. Both Pfizer and Moderna have made a booster shot uh, that specifically targets these variants, and that is ready to be tested. And, they, uh, and Johnson Johnson is doing the same thing, um, but I don't think theirs is quite ready to be tested. There's also uh, the idea of just giving people an extra shot. Um, so three in the case of Pfizer or Moderna, uh, and that just having a lot of antibodies against the spike protein may be enough um, to protect uh, someone against getting infected. And those are uh, either trials that are coming up uh, or um, underway. Uh, I don't know if the trials for the booster will be modified because we've already used the same technology, like if they'll allow fewer people or faster turnaround uh, in the regulatory agencies. I don't know that. Um, cases are coming down, uh, according to Johns Hopkins. Uh, the United States is the peak we just went through, uh, but in the last week, cases are up about 2%. Uh, the worry is that the variants are now going to cause another boom uh, in March, and um, that's why it's really important to maintain vigilance with your COVID hygiene, wearing a mask, social distancing, avoiding um, large groups of people, uh, etc. Okay, so um, we have been talking a little bit about um, ion gradients, and then uh, that leads to the uh, the idea of signaling in nervous tissue, uh, excitable tissue. Uh, it's probably the best ex studied example or at least the earliest studied example of cell-to-cell -cell signaling, and the rest of our uh, class will be about cell-to-cell -cell signaling. In fact, there are many people that consider the only thing that can be called cell physiology is cell-to-cell -cell signaling. So you've seen in some other classes a diagram of a synapse. This is a chemical synapse. Uh, where there's a release of chemical from one cell, it diffuses across a short distance and binds to receptors in a second cell. In electrical synapse, the two cells are physically connected. Um, but chemical synapses are much uh, more common than electrical synapses, uh, even though they're slower. So here's the diagram. Here's the um, real live uh, well, not live, but fixed picture in electron microscope microscopy of a synapse where you have a bunch of vesicles um, on the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell uh, ready to receive those vesicles, and the space that they've got to cross is right here in between the two cells called the synaptic cleft. 
So the idea is that the action potential reaches a synapse. The action potential would be a change in membrane voltage by ions moving across the, um, the membrane. That synaptic vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane uh, upon sensing the action potential, which is traveling along the membrane. That will cause the, the, um, those vesicles to fuse with the membrane and release their um, contents in doing that. Uh, in order for that to work, your plasma membrane has to stay fluid. Uh, and so if you change the phase of your plasma membrane, make it solid instead of liquid, you can have uh, decreased synaptic transmission. So this is why putting ice on a, uh, a uh, something that hurts makes it uh, feel numb is because you're getting uh, temperature effects of reduced synaptic transmission. Uh, neurotransmitter then diffuses across the synaptic cleft, okay, that small distance. It binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell, uh, and then that receptor will change conformation as a result of uh, binding its uh, ligand, and then something happens, like uh, if it's a muscle, maybe the muscle contracts by, and you have release of calcium causing that contraction. Or um, there's a signal that goes to the cell membrane, or sorry, the nucleus, um, that results in a hormone being transcribed, translated, and then released. Same thing for any other protein, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the signaling is not always in one direction. Okay, can be from the postsynaptic cell to the presynaptic cell. That's called retrograde signaling. At the um, synapse, uh, where these vesicles are releasing these neurotransmitters, uh, there are a lot of things that are happening that we have uh, now talked about in some way. Okay, so you have way back here, you see all these little vesicles right uh, at the synapse. Okay, these vesicles are loaded up with neurotransmitter um, uh, in uh, right next to um, where they're going to be released. And uh, you may use a pump and you may use a channel to do that. So the neurotransmitter is this red dot in this case. So in, in, in this example, there's a pump that is pumping in hydrogen. That hydrogen is being exchanged out for the neurotransmitter in, um, and you end up with a vesicle fill, filled with neurotransmitter. Um, uh, that uh, vesicle can uh, have a vesicle or a synapse specific vesicle protein inserted in it called synaptotagmin. Um, and then the um, vesicle will dock with the plasma membrane through the snare complex. Okay, uh, we talked about this before when we we're talking about how receptors are, are how vesicles know where to go and deliver their cargo. You have proteins in the vesicle membrane, proteins in the receiving membrane. Uh, these are called snares, sometimes called snaps. Um, and they are families of proteins, and they have to be compatible so that this vesicle doesn't go floating off and deliver its neurotransmitter into some other compartment, like a mitochondrion or something like that. It's um, binding with uh, its compatible snare in the plasma membrane, and that's where it knows how to bind. The botulism, botulism toxin, or Botox for, sure, uh, for short, um, is a protease that cuts these proteins and does not allow this docking to happen. And so it can prevent synaptic transmission that way. Um, at, when an action potential arrives at the cell uh, membrane, there's a voltage-gated calcium channel. So the voltage over that membrane is going to change because of the action potential. The voltage gating calcium channel opens that calcium channel. Calcium is high outside, low inside. Calcium floods into the cell. 
and that's associated with a fusing of the synaptic vesicle with the cell membrane and then release of neurotransmitter goes across the synaptic cleft binds to the postsynaptic cell this uh, vesicle that just fused uh, will be taken back up um, it'll be coated with clathrin we talked about that before it'll be pinched off by dynamin we talked about that before uh, that's a GTP dependent um, uh, protein that pinches off the neck of vesicles and then you can take your uh, vesicle uncoat the clathrin and then refill it and uh, use it again uh, so not all so the neurotransmitter that's been released can be taken back up into the presynaptic cell by specific uh, pumps and or channels. Um, not all neurotransmitters are recycled. Acetylcholine is one that is not recycled, um, but many are recycled. Okay, so the snare complex, okay, and dynamin and clathrin. We've seen all these before when we talked about receptor media endocytosis. Um, and they are generally specific to vesicle traffic. And so it's not, shouldn't be too surprising that you see them in synaptic vesicles. All right. Uh, this one, uh, what other pathway uses clathrin? Manose 6-phosphate uh, receptors. We saw that. Um, uses clathrin in delivering these digestive enzymes to the lysosome. Low-density lipoprotein, LDL, we saw this is the import of cholesterol, we saw clathrin used there. Transferrin, uh, Tierra told us about how transferrin um, brings iron into the cell and clathrin is used there, so all of the above is the answer. Okay, um, so for the rest of this class, we're going to talk about signal transduction. We just did talk about signal transduction, the, a very common um, type of signal transduction in that uh, signal transduction in neurons through synapses. This is signal transduction um, in a more general sense, where something from outside the cell uh, stimulates a change inside the cell. It doesn't always have to be from the outside of the cell, but the general scenario we're going to talk about is something is floating around in the blood. It is recognized by a receptor on the cell. That receptor on the cell does something, changes conformation or whatever, and starts off a series of events, uh, like a cascade, that causes some kind of change inside the cell. That's the general scenario we're going to talk about. Um, the receptors uh, that are on the cell surface is where a lot of the regulation happens. They're usually in very low copy number. Um, so whereas you might have hundreds of thousands of copies of a protein like actin in a cell, you might have a few dozen copies of a receptor for something in a cell, like the growth hormone receptor. Um, the growth hormone receptor, re these receptors are going to be membrane bound. They'll have a binding domain that is facing the blood. Um, and then they'll have the membrane bound part and they may have an intracellular domain or not. Um, they, so they have, uh, part of them facing the outside of the environment in the cell and then whatever is uh, going to interact with the outside environment is going to change the receptor in some way, change its shape some way, change its conformation some way, and that change is going to be delivered. The message from that change is going to be delivered to inside the cell. And it uh, could be physically touching or it could be because the receptor moves into a coated pit, something like that. It's an example of growth hormone binding to the growth hormone receptor in um, in uh, real live 3D image of what they look like. 
growth hormone receptor dimerizes, and this is they're showing you one receptor, two receptors here with growth hormone uh, bound to it. Okay, so before we talked about this idea of binding affinity, and the same thing works for receptors, KD, same rationale as the KM for enzymes. Um, the, uh, the difference is the if we're talking about KD binding constant, it's the fraction of uh, the response, okay? So in KM, it's um, the fraction of how fast the enzyme can go. So KM, it's the enzyme goes from 0 to 100% of its uh, rate of catalysis. KD, it goes from um, uh, no receptors bound to all the receptors bound. But um, at half of the response, either if you're talking about the rate at which something is catalyzed or the uh, half of all the bind, um, receptors available that are bound up, the concentration at that half response uh, is an indicator of binding affinity. So if you are, um, you have these two uh, receptors. Um, in the case of this red one here, uh, it takes, um, for half the response, it takes one nanomolar uh, concentration of the ligand. Uh, for uh, this guy, for half the response, uh, it takes uh, much less than that, maybe 10, 10 times less than that. To get half the response for this uh, blue one. So uh, this would be considered, the blue one would be considered higher affinity for the whatever is being bound than in the red one. And this property of how it binds um, its ligand is an intrinsic property of the receptor that you can identify what the receptor is by the shape of this curve. Okay, for receptors, typically the concentration of the ligand is lower relative to the KD than it is for enzymes, okay? Um, and typically they are regulated at below their KD. So the concentration of the thing that's going to bind to the receptor is going to be below the KD, okay, in this range. The concentration that's floating around in your blood is going to be down in this range. It's not going to be up in this range. Okay. So the idea is that if you have something floating around in your blood, like a hormone like insulin, and it's re regulated, it's maintained at a concentration in your blood that is below the KD for its receptor, um, insulin receptors. Uh, the insulin receptors are in cells. Insulin is floating around in your blood. Let's say the KD for insulin is 0.5 whatever, okay, 0.5 nanomol or something like that. Then the typical concentration of insulin in your blood is going to be way below that, say 0.1, okay. So if the number of insulin receptors is constant on the cell surface, you don't change that. Just for the sake of this question, of course they do change, but for the sake of this question, let's say they don't. And you increase the concentration of insulin in the blood, what happens? What happens is A, you stimulate those pathways more. So if you look at this curve, this red one right here, okay? There's the uh, KD right here is one. We're saying that the concentration of insulin is uh, floating around the blood is way down here. So that if I now increase the concentration of insulin in the blood, I go from, say, right here to right here, I get more of a response as a result of that because I'm on the steep part of this curve, okay? Same thing on this guy. If the KD is right here, and but the concentration of the blood is way down here someplace, if I go from here to here, that's a steep part of the curve, I get a big change. 
So as to why are um, uh, ligands that bind to receptors on cells um, regulated at much lower than their KD, it's because then you're always in the steep part of this curve, okay? And that you just change the amount of stuff floating around your blood just a little bit and you get a big response as a result of that. Versus if you regulated them out here, if I change the concentration from two to three, I don't get much of a change in response, okay, on either one of these. So you want to be on the steep part of the curve. All right. Uh, a very common theme in cell signaling is uh, the phosphorylation, dephosphorylation cycle, also receptor dimerization, also GTP, GDP exchange. Okay, in this example of JAK-STAT, um, we have two different proteins uh, that are associated with each other. You have a receptor and a JAK kinase. Uh, these receptors exist as monomers, individual units. Once they bind a ligand, they will dimerize two units coming together, forming a dimer. And that dimerization acts as a trigger to activate this enzyme, JAK, which is associated with the receptor. And JAK will then um, autophosphorylate. It'll take ATP and phosphorylate itself then it acts like a kinase to phosphorylate other things like the receptor itself. So this sort of sequence of, it, of events where you see uh, dimerization after binding a ligand, that's really common. Or you see phosphorylation after binding a ligand, that's really common. And then the GTP, GDP exchange we're going to run into. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to run into it. Um, in the case of um, the uh, adding on a phosphate, things that add on a phosphate are called kinases. Okay, so I'm, I'm taking ATP, um, taking the terminal phosphate off of ATP, adding it onto some other substrate. Could be myself, could be another protein. Um, leaving ATP behind, that's a kinase and then removing that phosphor, phosphate group from the thing that got phosphorylated that's done by a phosphatase. So kinases add phosphates, phosphatases remove phosphates. There are hundreds of kinds of kinase. There are hundreds of kinds of phosphatase. So this is a general name for a protein that uses the terminal phosphate from ATP to phosphorylate another protein that's called a kinase and the general name for a protein that removes that phosphate is called a phosphatase. Okay, these aren't specific names. For the GTP GDP thing, um, almost all the time what you're going to see is that when GTP, T with like Tom, is bound to a protein then it's going to be in the on state or the active state. And when that GTP is exchanged for GDP, it'll be in the off state. Okay? So GDP, D like dog, off. GTP, G -T, T like Tom, on. Sometimes what you'll see is that there is uh, the ability to take that GTP and and turn it into GDP, hydrolyze that GTP into GDP plus P on the protein itself. And sometimes there are separate proteins to do that. So in the case where there's separate proteins, there is a GAP protein. This is a GTPase activating protein. That's the one that's going to split the GTP into making GDP. And then there's going to be a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, or a GEF, that's going to switch out the GDP that is on there now and replace it with the GTP that's on there. So sometimes the activity of GEF and GAP are all in one, 
and sometimes those are separate proteins doing these functions. Okay. We talk a lot about this class about second messengers. Uh, and sometimes what gets lost is what's the first message. The first message is the thing that is floating around in the blood that's going to bind to your receptor. So, for example, growth hormone uh, that we talked about way back here. Growth hormone. That was the first message. And then a second messenger is something that uh, builds up inside the cell. So the first message is outside the cell. The second messenger is inside the cell. Um, that's almost universally true. And I'll tell you when it's not going to be true. Uh, I think there's one exception to that that we'll talk about in this class. So think about the first message being out in the blood. And the second message is something made in response to receiving the first message. And the second messenger happens inside the cell, not outside the cell, inside the cell. That is key. People get that confused a lot. So I'm going to say it again. The first message is the thing floating around in the blood. That's like growth hormone or insulin. Okay, Insulin or growth hormone is going to bind to a receptor on a cell. That receptor is going to change conformation as a result of binding its ligand, growth hormone or insulin or any other kind of hormone. It's going to start a series of events inside the cell that will result in a second messenger going to be made. And that second messenger is inside the cell, not outside the cell. Okay, These are types of second messengers. Cyclic AMP is a derivative of ATP. Cyclic GMP is a derivative of GTP. Diacylglycerol is a derivative of a uh, phospholipid that's in the cell membrane. Inositol triphosphate is a derivative of a um, phospholipid in the cell membrane. So these are made inside the cell as a result of something binding to outside the cell, which is the, the first messenger. Okay. Um, these second messengers are made from things that are common in the cell. So there's lots of ATP in the cell, 500 pounds a day that you're going through. You can convert ATP into cyclic AMP um, using an enzyme called adenyl cyclase right here. And you can do that quickly. Uh, so um, that is a common second messenger. So as a result of something binding to the cell, adenyl cyclase is stimulated and you make lots of cyclic AMP inside the cell as a result of that. And that would be called a second messenger. So besides cyclic AMP as a second messenger, other second messengers can be calcium, nitric oxide, which is a gas. They can be second messengers. Um, IP3 that we talked about here, DAG, cyclic GMP, all those can be second messengers. Okay, why do that? Why have two messengers? Why not just have the hormone do the thing? or bring the hormone inside the cell and have that be the message. It's because at every step along the way, uh, you get amplification. So the first message in here is epinephrine. Okay, This is what's floating around your blood, and it's kept at very, very low concentration, 10 to the minus 10 molar. It activates adenyl cyclase um, as a result of binding to a receptor, and we'll, we'll detail about how that happens. Adenyl cyclase in turn makes cyclic AMP and cyclic AMP can be at 10, 10 to the minus 6 molar. So already you have a four um, order of magnitude difference in concentration. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 more oops, cyclic AMP than epinephrine. Cyclic AMP will activate protein kinase A. Kinase is a phosphorylator. Uh, that 
by virtue of phosphorylating things, you'll activate lots of enzymes. And by activating lots of enzymes, you'll make lots of product. By the time you get to the product at the end of this cascade of events, starting with epinephrine at 10 to the minus 10 molar, you can get 10 million times amplification um, by the time you get to the product. So it's going to seem uh, very much uh, like there's a simpler way to do this. Doesn't matter. This is how it evolved. Uh, an advantage of how this is evolved is you get a big amplification of the signal. Um, and also you get a chance for regulation at each one of these steps. And we'll talk about that. OK. This slide here will get you lots and lots of points in this class. This is a generic version of how G protein signaling works. G stands for globular. Um, and this thing here is called a G unit, um, uh, just like 50 cent. So the Globular protein signaling is a very common way that cells signal. There are hundreds of different types of G protein signaled pathways. GPCR stands for G protein coupled receptor. Um, and it's a very common uh, uh, signaling pathway that has subtleties between one version of this and another version of this, depending on what receptor there is, what the effector is, what it turns on. But here's the general idea. Uh, in your cell membrane, you have a receptor. It's in its inactive state when um, it doesn't bind. It, it doesn't have the first messenger bound to it. It turns into an active state after it binds its first messenger. That will change its shape, and it allows it to interact. You can see that we went from inactive to active here, and now you've created this binding site on the active uh, receptor as a result of binding its first messenger. The uh, G unit uh, is made up of a G alpha subunit uh, and a G beta gamma subunit. These are not membrane-bound proteins, but they're membrane-associated proteins. That's what that little squiggle is right there. And they start off inactive with a GDP bound to them, GDP. Okay. But once you have an active receptor, remember this is a fluid mosaic membrane, so all of these components in the membrane can move. And this is moving back and forth. In this state, if it bumps into an inactive receptor, there's nothing to receive it, so it doesn't matter. Now, if it bumps into this activated receptor, there's a little binding site there for it to be activated. Then there's an exchange of GDP, D like dog, for GTP, okay, T like Tom, and it goes from being an inactive G protein to an active G protein. As an active G protein, the G alpha subunit separates from G beta gamma and also changes shape. Compare this shape here to this shape here. And then it'll interact with an effector. An effector is something that is going to turn on as a result of this uh, signaling pathway. Uh, so this could be adenocyclase, it could be um, all kinds of things. It will typically be something that's going to make a second messenger. So uh, again, you start off with an inactive receptor, it binds its first ligand, it becomes an active receptor, changes shape. Because it changes shape, it can now interact with the G unit. Once it does interact with the G unit, that's the signal to switch out GDP for GTP. Once GTP is bound, it changes the shape of G alpha. G alpha separate from G beta gamma. G alpha can now interact with an effector and turn that effector on. This whole thing happens in less than a minute. Um, so 
Uh, and then to shut this off, what you do is you hydrolyze that GTP, goes back to GDP, it uh, changes back to its original shape, and the effector turns off. Okay. Uh, real live and not cartoony diagrams. So this is what they really look like. The difference between an inactive receptor and an active receptor. You can see this domain showing up here um, when, when it's active. And now can interact with the G unit. Um, uh, whereas before that domain was uh, uh, had a different shape. And so was not interacting with the G unit. There are very diverse types of G protein coupled receptors, GPCR. So this is the B, the G protein coupled receptor thing is this, okay? And there's lots of different kinds of G protein coupled receptors, okay? And they turn on different pathways. So there are G alpha S and G alpha I. So the S stands for stimulatory, I stands for inhibitory. Um, um, and the effector in the stimulatory case is adenylcyclase. In the inhibitory, it's adenylcyclase, uh, uh, specifically a potassium channel activated by adenylcyclase. Um, in the stimulatory, what happens is cyclic AMP goes up in the cell. And the inhibitory goes down in the cell. And then here are some specific receptors that are uh, known for that. And then there's lots more. And this is a pretty short list. Um, there are many, 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 many kinds of G protein coupled receptors. Okay, which of these conditions would you predict to alter G protein coupled signaling? Would the fluidity of the membrane matter? Yes, it does matter because this the G protein coupled signaling has to depend on this thing's ability to change shape. If the membrane's stiff, that might be inhibited. This has got to shuttle back and forth, even though it's not membrane bound, it's membrane associated. So the membrane has to be, uh, be fluid in order for that to happen. And the, and the effector is also going to change shape um, uh, after it has G alpha uh, bound to it or not. Uh, the KD of the receptor for the ligand. Yes. So if the ligand binds uh, when there's very low concentration of the, the primary messenger floating around the blood, then the, the, you'll get G protein coupled signaling happening more often. If it's, if it takes a lot of receptor floating around, or sorry, a lot of first messenger floating around the blood, before uh, the uh, receptor will bind, then you'll have less G protein coupled signaling for that particular pathway. The KD of the effector for the G alpha subunit. So that's here. Okay. Um, the, the binding affinity between the effector and the G alpha subunit. Certainly that matters. So how tightly is it going to bond depends on how long this effector is going to stay on before it gets shut off again. So of course, all those things matter. Looking at adenylcyclase, this particular effector, uh, again, you see this sort of diagram where each one of these barrels here, these tubes is a transmembrane region. It doesn't look like it's all stretched out in real life. It doesn't look like it's all stretched out in the membrane here. That's just how you can draw that in 2D. Um, this is more like what it looks like in 3D. Um, it's a very well studied uh, protein because it's important in lots of uh, signaling um, in lots of diseases. There's a drug called forscolin uh, that can lock it on the, in the on state. So um, in real life, in cells, adenylcyclase would be on for just a few seconds to make cyclic AMP because it's really efficient. And cyclic AMP can uh, rise quickly in the cell by the uh, an active adenylcyclase. Uh, 
if you just want to know as a researcher what happens when this thing is on, you use this drug and you lock it in the on state. And you make buckets and buckets of it, uh, cyclic AMP and then you see what happens to the cell. Um, in the same cell, you can have both uh, GPCRs, G protein coupled receptors that um, activate pathways that are stimulatory and inhibitory in the same cell. So uh, you can have receptors and um, primary signals. Uh, the first messenger could be something like epinephrine or glucagon or ACTH, uh, these different hormones. They will stimulate adenyl cyclase activity when they bind to their receptors. You can have inhibitory hormones binding to their receptors like PGE1 or adenosine, um, and they activate different um, binding sites on adenyl cyclase. And the cyclic AMP concentration that results will be a sum of the activity of these two pathways. So if you have more stimulation than you have inhibition, you get more cyclic AMP. If you have more inhibition than um, stimulation, you have less cyclic AMP. Um, there are these models um, where I say this is how it works, but how do they know how it works? Uh, these experiments are done with FRET. Uh, that's fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So that you have a uh, a reporting fluorophore uh, that emits light at a certain wavelength, uh, and you can get an idea of how close it is uh, to something else depending on um, the wavelength that is being emitted. So um, in this case, you la la label the G beta gamma and the G alpha with different colors. And when they are together, you get one kind of color. And when they have separated uh, during signaling, you get a different kind of color, okay, reported um, out of that. So this is a combination of the yellow and the blue signal. Uh, and um, uh, later on in the signal, when G beta gamma and G alpha have separated, you can separate out the yellow signal from the blue signal. So this allows you to get an idea for, does this actually happen? And yes, it does actually happen, but also how long does it happen? So um, this is um, a, a stimulation event uh, where uh, G beta gamma is released from GS alpha GS alpha is uh, stimulating the the effector, and you can see it. It only lasts for a few seconds. Okay, less than fifteen seconds before it's shut off. Okay. Um. So what? So we've got things binding to things, and cyclic AMP goes up or cyclic AMP goes down. What happens when things go wrong? So cholera which is a disease um, caused by contaminated water. Um, and uh, the microorganism um, produces a toxin, and the toxin prevents the GS-alpha subunit from hydrolyzing GTP. So you can switch out GDP for GTP, but then you can't split that GTP. So you turn it on, but then you can't turn it off. Downstream what happens is the large intestine stops resorbing water. The signal for GTP on is to stop resorbing water and so it's on all the time. It stops resorbing water um, uh, altogether and um, then there's a lot of water in the um, digestive matter and you don't recover that water, and people die from dehydration because they have uncontrollable diarrhea. Um, so the cholera toxin prevents the GTP from being hydrolyzed and turning off this pathway. So when the pathway is on, um, it's at 
uh, th that would be a signal for those cells to stop resorbing water. Um, that signal is on all the time and they don't ever resorb water. Um, and so um, you have the disease phenotype. Uh, for pertussis toxin or uh, and which causes whooping cough, there's a GI alpha, so an inhibitory, inhibitory uh, alpha subunit that is inactivated. And because the inhibitory is inactivated, the you get the action of the stimulatory pathway, which is to increase mucus secretion. And so you get too much mucus secretion, and uh, it can... Uh, fill up your throat and you get that sort of whooping sound uh, when they're coughing. I remember um, uh, uh, calling a doctor when my kids were little and they just um, they said put them on the phone and just by listening to a kid uh, who's got whooping cough um, they can uh, they can diagnose what it is by the characteristic sound that is made by just constricted uh, throat uh, and the air going through that constricted throat and the coughing is caused by the excess mucus production. Okay, um, it doesn't have to be adenyl cyclase. There can be other effectors. So here's an example of acetylcholine as the first messenger binding to a G protein coupled receptor. The G protein coupled receptor switches out GDP for GDP comes active. This is an inhibit uh, inhibitory signal. And in this case, G beta gamma um, interacts with the effector, which is a potassium channel. So um, this is a ligand gated channel. And as a result of binding the G beta gamma ligand, it opens up potassium and potassium is high inside, low outside, potassium will flood out as a result of that. Of, of binding acetylcholine. Uh, okay, so that's G protein coupled receptors. Um, there are many other types of signaling, um, and this is just an introduction into the main players, and then we'll get into more detail as we pursue the class. One other main player is called RAS. Uh, RAS is a very um, important and common oncogene. So what an oncogene is, is a cancer-causing gene. And some people get confused about this because they think, well, if we know that this gene causes cancer, why don't we just get rid of it? And that's not, uh, that's not a helpful way of thinking about it. So I think uh, a helpful way of thinking about this is uh, oncogenes are genes that you need for normal function. They just typically break a lot. So um, just last night, my sump pump in my basement broke. And for some reason, I have replaced like two dozen. Uh, well, may, that's an exaggeration. Maybe one dozen of sump pumps. And sump pumps for other people's tend to last like 20 years at a time. Mine just typically breaks. I need a sump pump. A sump pump is something that keeps your basement dry, pumps, up, pumps out excess water. Um, so I, it's not that I can live without it. It just, it tends to break. So you have genetic material in your DNA because of its position, because of how it's wound, because of, of its sequence, just some of your sequence tends to break. It's not that you don't need it, it just tends to break. Um, and those are oncogenes. Uh, another way of thinking that is if you drive a beater car, a lot of college kids are poor and they drive a beater car, you've become come to know your car well enough to know that there is a thing on your car that's gonna break and it's not the and it's not that you're going to fix it and then it won't break again. You know it's going to break again. You probably have uh, fixed it three times already. If it's your brakes, or if it's your uh, turn signal, or if it's you got a 
gas cap that keeps on falling off or whatever. You know that thing is going to break and it's going to break again. You need it. So every time it breaks, you got to fix it. Um, those are like oncogenes, okay? And RAS is a common oncogene. So what, how does RAS work? RAS works like uh, the G protein coupled signaling, but with each of the parts uh, separate instead of all one unit. So you have RAS itself. You have a GEF, a guanine nucleotide exchange factor that is a separate protein. And what it's going to do is it's going to switch out GDP for GTP. Okay, we talked about this a few slides ago. And then you also have a separate protein called GAP, uh, GTPase activating protein. And what it's going to do is it's going to split GTP into GDP. So you have, instead of all one unit, like in the G proteins, you have a separate protein that is going to switch out GTP for GDP, and a separate protein that is going to uh, split the GTP uh, once it, it is bound. And also, like G protein coupled signaling, uh, when RAS has GTP bound to it, it is considered active. When it has GDP bound to it, it's considered inactive. Uh, RAS is signaling tends to last longer than G protein, so minutes to hours rather than seconds that it's going to be in the on state. Okay? But you can see that hopefully it has things in common with uh, G protein coupled signal. Okay. Um, uh, what does RAS look like with GDP bound to it versus GTP bound to it? Um, when uh, it's in the GTP uh, bound state, that extra terminal phosphate interacts with domains on the RAS and brings them close in. This is considered the on state. When it's missing that terminal phosphate, those ears of the protein don't interact with that terminal phosphate and it's in the off state. Okay, uh, another type of signaling and another type of um, second messenger. So not adenyl cyclase, and we're not talking about GTP, we're talking about a different kind of second messenger. So again, this is something made on the inside of the cell after the first messenger arrives on the outside of the cell. And this is DAG and IP3. So DAG stands for diacylglycerol, IP3 stands for inositol uh, triphosphate. Uh, in your um, plasma membrane, you have phospholipids that have two acyl chain tails, a glycerol backbone, and then a head group on them. Uh, in the case of uh, um, phosphatidyl inositol, or PI, um, as a result of binding to a first messenger uh, and an effector being bound, what happens is you get the head group uh, being cut off and generating IP3, which is one of the second messengers, and also the two acyl chain tails, diacyl, two acyl chain tails, plus glycerol, that's diacylglycerol. And both of these things uh, end up as second messengers. So this is what you started with as a result of um, binding that first messenger and an effector getting activated. This is what you generate, okay? these two molecules as a result of that. OK, putting things together as to why would this happen and what's something that could happen as a result of this? Okay, let's say we have a first messenger binding to a uh, ligand. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, first messenger is the ligand binding to uh, a receptor and it's a G protein coupled receptor. Okay, so not RAS but a G-protein coupled receptor. It changes shape as a result of binding that. The uh, G unit interacts with that, 
uh, G beta gamma and G uh, alpha sub separate, you know, switching out of GTP for GDP. And now G alpha interacts with not adenyl cyclase, but a different kind of effector, an enzyme called phospholipase C. Phospholipase is a enzyme that cuts lipids, uh, hence its name. And it's going to take uh, a phospholipid from the cell membrane, the one we just talked about, and it's going to create a DAG signaling molecule and IP3 signaling molecule. Uh, IP3 signaling molecule is going to diffuse through the cell. It's going to bind to a big old calcium channel in the ER membrane. And when it binds to that big old calcium channel, calcium is stored on, in the inside of the ER and it gets released into the cytoplasm where calcium is typically low. Okay, That calcium that gets released into the cytoplasm binds to another enzyme called protein kinase C. We sort of know what it's going to do because um, it's a kinase, so it's going to phosphorylate things. Protein kinase C then interacts with DAG, which got produced by phospholipase C, and it gets activated. It turns into the active state, and it's going to go add kinases onto a lot of other things. Okay, so it'll phosphorylate um, lots of other things. What this is showing here is, as a result of this signaling, you can also get um, some interaction between the ER uh, and a membrane-bound protein in the ER and a calcium channel uh, in the plasma membrane that lets in even more calcium as a result of that. Okay, We're not going to worry so much about that. So PKC stands for protein kinase C here. Kinase is going to phosphorylate things. That's what's going to happen when protein kinase C gets activated by DAG and the calcium that's released from IP3. And then in order, and that's the on part of the signal, in order to shut it off, you would uh, activate a phosphatase and that will dephosphorylate things. Okay, uh, here's another example of signaling using DAG and IP3. Um, in this case, uh, phospholipase C gets activated. So we're not going to talk about the G protein coupled receptors that happened before this slide, uh, but it does happen, and phospholipase C gets activated. Okay. Um, the active phospholipase C is going to create DAG and IP3, okay? And one of the things that is bound to this phospholipid is a protein called Tubby. And so when you cut DA, uh, this phospholipid to create DAG and IP3, Tubby gets released. It was bound up to this phospholipid, now it gets released. And Tubby is a transcription factor. A transcription factor is bind to DNA and they affect the activity of that DNA, the transcriptional activity of that DNA. Tubby will go to the through the nuclear pore to the DNA, bind onto that DNA as a transacting factor, a transcription factor, and turn on uh, genes that are involved in fat metabolism. So this uh, gene got its name from a mutant in mice who is missing uh, parts of this pathway, and as a result was obese. Uh, they had on adult onset obesity. So they could not uh, truly activate the genes to um, metabolize fat, beta-oxidation enzymes, and so instead those uh, lipids accumulated and they had adult onset obesity. And cruelly, the the people with that um, who discovered this mutation uh, called the mutation Tubby, um, and then this protein called got called Tubby. Okay, um, so that was like the first example of not showing you on all, everything on the slide, but something on the outside of the cell um, 
uh, arrived to a receptor. That receptor activated a G-protein coupled receptor, which uh, acted as turned on the effector phospholipase C, and then this takes it over from there. Something goes to the nucleus and it changes how the cell behaves. So something happened, arrived on the outside of the cell, changes how the cell uh, uh, behaves as a result of that. Here's another example of um, something coming from the outside of the cell, changing how the cell uh, acts on the inside of the cell. And again, the, the beginning part of this pathway is not shown on this diagram, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So you have some kind of first signal arriving to a G protein coupled receptor. You have the G unit uh, being activated. Uh, GTP gets substituted for GDP. Uh, G alpha um, uh, interacts with adenyl cyclase. It's stimulatory, so adenyl cyclase produces cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP builds up in the cell. It uh, is bound by an enzyme called protein kinase A. Uh, this is really common uh, kinase in cells. And protein kinase A has both catalytic sites on it and regulatory sites on it. The regulatory sites are the sites that bind cyclic AMP. Uh, so uh, these cyclic AMP molecules that are made by adenyl cyclase as a result of being stimulated by um, the G protein coupled receptor, they bind in a cooperative manner. What that means is once the first one binds, it makes it easier for the second one to bind, which makes it easier for the third one to bind, which makes it easier for the fourth one to bind. And then once you have all four of those binding sites occupied by cyclic AMP, the regulatory units come away from the catalytic subunits. The catalytic subunits travel through the nuclear pore into the nucleus. They're catalytic subunits of a kinase, so they're going to start phosphorylating things. And they start a cascade of phosphorylation. So they uh, phosphorylate a protein called CREB, cyclic AMP responsive element binding protein. Okay, cyclic AMP responsive element binding protein. That gets phosphorylated. As a result of getting phosphorylated, it changes shape. And now it can bind to cyclic AMP responsive elements. These, this is a sequence of DNA that responds to cyclic AMP. So it has the right shape to bind to that part of the DNA with its phosphate onto it. That phosphate then recruits other proteins uh, uh, like CBP P300. Uh, and then as a result of this one protein on top of another protein, now RNA polymerase 2 can come onto that gene and transcribe genes as a result of that. So you had a first uh, signal, primary signal, first messenger arriving outside the cell, and as a result of that arriving outside the cell, you have new genes being transcribed on the inside of the cell. Okay, one more time on this. G protein coupled receptor gets activated, G protein uh, gets stimulated, G alpha GTP binds with adenyl cyclase, it's stimulatory, adenyl cyclase makes cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits of PKA in a cooperative manner. First one makes it easier for the second one, which makes it easier for the third one, which makes it easier for the fourth one. Once all four binding sites are occupied, catalytic subunits are released. They go into the nucleus. They uh, phosphorylate CREB, cyclic AMP re ele response element binding protein. Once it's phosphorylated, it has the right shape to bind to the cyclic AMP responsive elements. That uh, uh, recruits other proteins, which then recruit RNA polymerase, which activates transcription of genes. So you get new genes being transcribed as a result of a hormone, for example, binding to the outside of the cell. Okay, this is just uh, some uh, realistic 
um, 3D renditions of the actual shape of the regulatory subunits versus the catalytic subunits and where the cyclic AMP uh, molecules bind. And that's it. Sorry again for the technical problems today. We'll get that fixed by Thursday.